Welcome to Merchman Seeds Cup of Joe. On this episode, we have an action-packed show this week with a great agronomic discussion about the upcoming weather forecast, the drought, and how to best move forward tending to your crop in current conditions. Area Sales Manager Avery Bennett is back with more updates. Welcome to Mershman Seeds Cup of Joe. Today we have Avery and Lynn, and we're going to get a crop progress update. What's going on out in the field, Avery? Yeah, I mean, here in Area 17, so my territory southeast Iowa, northeast Missouri, I mean, the big thing is rain. I think the lack of rain, the dry soil and all that's got the farmers' moods pretty depressed. So hopefully this weekend, if we can get a little bit of moisture in the ground, I think it's going to lead us into maybe double crop opportunities um, and then replants. I think we do have a standstill on some replants. Um, we're telling guys maybe not to put the beans in the ground until we get some moisture um, because we're digging three, four inches down to even find it. So it's pretty dry out there. Um, but the stuff that was planted early, I mean, the corn that's planted in April, the beans that are planted in April, I mean, it's it's pretty amazing to see how well they've held on and how good they look. Um, we talked earlier, um, two weeks ago, I was out in the field. You could definitely tell it had that ugly duck, duckling stage that you guys talked about last week. Um, hadn't find the nitrogen yet. And then when you saw it this week, you could definitely tell the color has changed. It's beautiful dark green um, and it looks good. And that's our uh, new Mershman corn, the 111 day that we're pretty excited about. Um, so, I mean, for how dry we are, I think all the activities happening down below the soil, the roots digging deep, trying to find the water, moisture and nitrogen. So we gotta be pretty happy about that. Later planted stuff, I mean, it's coming along. I think the prem or the optimal date that I saw on the replant stuff that was able to get into the moisture and bounce back up was about that May, what did I have? May 18th. Um, I was questioning in it um, when we planted that 18th, uh, maybe the 22nd, 23rd range. Um, we were kind of getting drier and drier, but I mean, the farmers were able to get the seed into the moisture and those seeds were able to bounce up and get going. So I think replant situations in that window, I still think we're very, very good. Corn stages, let's just talk stages, is, you know, we're right around that V7, V5 range, I'd say. Um, so, unfortunately, uh, Monday, I was at a conference, and Sunday, I, we had a little shower come in, but it mostly was hail, and uh, we heard this one farmer, two farmers within a mile radius had some bad hail damage over where me and my wife live in Illinois, and uh, it's pretty, it was a replant field of mm -hmm. his corn, and he told us that, you know, 95% of the farmers probably wouldn't have replanted that. So how particular he is, probably 99% of the farmers wouldn't replant it. And uh, unfortunately, it's stripped down pretty much to nothing. Right. So at that V7 stage that you're talking about with hail damage, that's, that's, that's not a fun stage because it's, it's definitely, he's going to be going back in for the third round, unfortunately, for replant. So... You're talking about drought, you're talking about dry conditions that fits into a handful of situations from what I've taken phone calls about this week as well. And there's an article that we will link to on Cool Bean talking about how to figure out um, if soybeans planted in the ground are gonna be viable. And I think that's pretty timely here as we're coming up to uh, the, the, the double crop season for sure. So what I wanna do is it, in this article it talks about uh, you want approximately 20% uh, soil moisture for the, to, to get a soybean out of the ground. So um, not a lot of people talk in the percent moisture ranges. So what I wanted to do is we're going to flip over here to the computer and we are right now I have uh, Tipton, Indiana. So we're going to go to West Point, Iowa is where we're sitting right now. This is the uh, Nutrien Ag Weather uh, website that I use from time to time. I think it's a really good resource for growers to look at. But what we have sitting here right now is West Point, Iowa, and you can scroll down and there's a whole bunch of different um, things that you can look at. There's uh, some uh, precipitation from a couple different model runs from what we're looking at for what, what's coming in the in the, the next 10 day. But what, we're, what I wanna look at currently here is this 10 day soil condition. And this is a forecast, so it's looking at how much moisture that he is for uh, Eric Snodgrass is forecasting for the next 10 days out but if you scroll down here and you look at uh, where we are currently sitting uh, West Point Iowa has 14.3 percent 
uh, soil moisture conditions. So that is below the 20% line, obviously, and that's something that um, we probably wouldn't be suggesting, like what you're talking about. If you go out and dig in the ground, it's dry, down to four inches. So um, when you get plentiful rainfall, just as a, as a note here, when you get plentiful rainfall and we are at gravitational movement of water, so when you're at uh, soil holding capacity, uh, that's at 40%. So anything above 40% is gravitational. Field capacity is approximately 40%. It changes from different soil type to different soil type. But when you're looking at double crop, when you're looking at replant considerations on do I stick the beans in the ground, this is a good uh, resource and tool to look at to make comparisons. So Tipton, Indiana is one of our plants. They're sitting off, they're pretty dry too. They're looking at 16.3 currently where we're sitting right now. And if you go to uh, Olmsted, Illinois, which is our Southern plant, they're actually sitting pretty decent with, uh, what's that say, 22.4. So things to be looking at with dry weather. I just kind of wanted to highlight that. That's a pretty good tool for, for what we want to look at there. Um, any comments on that, you guys? I would say the, uh, the biggest thing we want to look at here when we're talking about the, the saturation point of the of the soil is you know 14.3 we start digging we you might actually see some moisture in the ground um, but we want we want to look for why that 20 percent is important is because we can get that seed to swell up and then we run out of moisture and we can't um, develop the radical and push that soybean up out of the ground so what we have what have happened is, is essentially that seeds swells up and then it just rots in the ground and we just don't have the the, the ability to, to retain enough moisture to push it up out of the ground. So when we were looking at this, I think like what Avery was talking about, it's very important to, uh, to use some tools that we have here because the ground can deceive you a little bit, especially when you get into the different soil types. You know, some of our black dirt, we might be setting a little bit better than this, but when you go down to like what you guys would plant on your double crop, um, pretty sandy. Probably, probably not setting on a lot of uh, free moisture there to, to get stuff moving plus then you know as we we move this down you know we're talking this in the four inch range our double crop means we want to plant that you know as shallow as possible so we can get up and going right now yeah on the sand as shallow as possible being in moisture correct correct you know you're talking more than four inches so it's just not worth the exercise to go through and uh you know do the wear and tear on your planter and, and plant that seed just for it to to not not develop and you know when we're looking at the 10 day forecast it's just there's nothing coming to, to to give us a lot of confidence to put that in the ground and then hope for rain correct correct and there's two different stages of what you were talking about there too is the there's the swelling stage and then there's actually when the soybean puts the radical on it, it needs moisture above and beyond that i know avery was sending me pictures of a replant he was doing for a guy that was planting after a rye crop that he chopped and uh the beans had enough moisture to germinate they swelled they put a radical down but then they dried up and died mm. so that's why exactly what you're talking about it's extremely important so and definitely in that field in the low areas you could see the stand come up and go but then once you got up on that little hill you know it was amazing how just add to the line where the moisture was gone and where nothing was there and our soil, you know, as we look at this too, we look at our soil temperature as well. And that's definitely playing a card against us when, you know, when we look at stuff in the spring, we talk about, you know, put our seed treatment on, it could sit in the ground for, you know, 21, 27 days. Oh, when our soil temps are so warm, that degradation process of the soybean happens a lot faster. So it just rots off in the ground and just never gets a chance to get going. Yeah, there's actually a really cool on uh, this nutrient ag weather as well. If you go back, there is a map on uh, bare soil evaporation and you can look at that right there it is uh, we're we're evaporating off you know, somewhere between an inch and three quarters per week so it plays a role in when you're looking at forecasting so yeah I think on that on that screen too then I think it gives us our daily totals of uh, evapotranspiration as well and, and most areas are looking at about a quarter of an inch a day that we're we're losing so right um, sounds pretty heinous when we're, we're talking about conservation of, of moisture and we're losing a quarter just every day we wake up, just count it gone, so. And, and if you go through there, you're busting that up and you're, you know, four inches you're digging down, but, or even if you're at two and a half, three inches, finding moisture and you're like, oh, and then I'm gonna plant this, but then you bust that up and it dries out. Your evaporation just increases tremendously. And well, there's rain in the forecast. There's always rain in the forecast, so. Um, some good news that we can talk about just a little bit. Uh, 
in our southern Illinois, Kentucky, Arkansas, Tennessee market, we have wheat yields that are coming off. Um, the first one that I've heard uh, officially is we had a 40 acre of Binti, which is our ultra, ultra early, come off at 105 bushel an acre. So uh, that was a, the growers are really, really happy about that. They're pulling them off a little bit earlier than what their neighbors are. They're in moisture down there. They have, mm -hmm. they have decent little moisture. So they're probably planting their beans a week to a week and a half earlier than, than what some of the other varieties out there are doing. So that Binti is an ultra early and it's, it's a pretty good proven line. So mm -hmm. I like that 105 bushel an acre. Um, Lynn, we were talking before the filming, you got uh, flowers. You betcha. Flowers are not just a woman's best friend, it's a farmer's too. So um, went and uh, we have a new individual that's coming on to Mershman Seeds for, for Area 14. So I was taking him around and we were uh, looking at some plots and just getting familiar with, with some products as we're, uh, you know, the big thing with him, just wanted to show what we look like now. And as we come back to the July sales meeting, how, how everything develops and just getting a feel for the varieties on what emergence looks like and, and some of the, the little gems that we like to see, you know, we go to the plots and you go out and look and look at our ugly Kennedys and you know when we introduce that to someone they just swear that that's the worst bean in the world but you know when the plot comes around to harvest it does what Kennedys does so we're looking at some of those characteristics and, and I happen to notice that uh, on the plot over in, in Huffton the 3-2 um, or sorry the 3-1 Lincoln the 3-2 McKinley and then uh, Kennedys the 3-6 and 3-7 Monroe were all uh, had a flower and, uh, and I would say right now, in that, in that side of the country, we caught a, maybe just a little bit more rain on uh, two rain events. We're, we're up to a whopping, I think, four tenths compared to some other spots. So um, they're definitely taking advantage of that, where our development is occurring very rapidly. Obviously, we're, we've hit the you know, reproductive stage, but we only have five trifoliates. So um, given the last three or four years, we're probably a month ahead of schedule. So. Stacking on nodes before uh, flowers before summer solstice, so we look to to be setting really well um, going into that. So that is uh, one thing. Now we need to be cognitive of is we're flowering. So if you have not done your post application, we need to be thinking about getting on that yeah. ASAP. What's the planning date on those? That planning date was April nineteenth. Gotcha. So relative to what a lot of farmers did in this area, that was on the tail end of the bean bean side of stuff. So. Um, three six three sevens is kind of in your your wheelhouse. So yeah. for those guys that uh, haven't done their post applications, I would be getting on it. Getting getting on it because we don't want to knock any any flowers off as we progress here, especially when we're setting up so so nice with that aspect. So um, you know the, the one question that I had gotten asked yesterday and uh, was we're really dry. Do I put residual in with my my post? What do I do? Do I leave that out and and hope for, hope for the best, or do I put it in and hope for rain and hope we have some reach back and, and we go from there. So I guess what's your thoughts on, on that as we look into the, those questions as we continue on with no rain? Well, I think you gotta be a little bit picky about what products you're choosing. Um, if, if there is uh, slight chances of rain, each, if you look on the label, each, uh, like a, any of the group 15 herbicides have like their activating amount of moisture rain that it takes. Uh, products like Outlook have a tendency to uh, have only need a quarter inch where certain products need like a half inch. So it kind of depends on what the forecast looks like because if you're at like a 50% chance of a couple three four tenths, um, maybe you're throwing the Outlook in into that knowing that, well, we're not gonna get a goose drowner. But if you have like no rain in the forecast, um, I actually am at a tendency to go to a little bit more expensive product like, uh, like a Zidua or a Perpetuo or a, like a, a Warrant mm -hmm. style product because th those aren't going to degrade on the ground quite as fast. Um, and they're gonna be there when you do get a rain and they will reach up and they will kill weeds at that point in time. So it kind of depends on a forecast. Um, and it also kind of depends on canopy. Are you in 30 inch rows? How fast are the beans growing? Um, in 15s, man, we got a lot of beans that look from the 70 mile an hour windshield. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of beans that look like they're real close to canopy. Yeah. So you might be able to get away without spending that extra 10, 11, 12 bucks. So. And that too goes what you're talking about, the canopy when we were looking at it. It's just amazing when we get into the construction and architecture of the beans, um, taking that into account too, depending on your row spacing. You know, like we're looking at the Monroe's. Uh, and talking with the with the guy, it's like this is a bean that we would swear is a what would be a bush bean, but it's really a, a 
thin line being that there is a petiole that is very long and it covers the row really well, but once that kind of falls off, then we have the, the main stem being there. So as I look at that um, on our operation, kind of looking at where beans are placed and how, how fast we're gonna get that, that coverage, we're there. I mean, we're, we're coming quick. We're probably within a week looking at uh, stuff uh, starting to canopy shut and, and looking to set pretty good. So um, I'm with you. I, I think it's really tough to spend that kind of money when you know there's no rain in the forecast, but at the same token, you know, guys on 30 inch rows, got to be a little bit cognizant if we don't get rain right we're leaving that open for uh sunlight to be used and it might not be used by the soybean plant right we have left avery and i i mean we've all looked at a lot of soybean fields this year too we've left a lot more 60,000, 70,000 plant stands that were fairly early that's something to yeah. take into account mm -hmm. as well so if you're at a thin stand you're going to want to definitely be layering your residuals in even though, though it's even it's going to take a little bit longer for those yep. beans to those beans to uh, very point. canopy as well so and I think that's kind of where we are now is people that are wanting to replant and we're right on that edge at 70 to 80 range, but the farmer's like, you know, it's not comfortable with that low population. And so we're like, you know, if you're comfortable, just throw an extra 60,000 out there. And pretty much what you're gonna do is, you know, protect yourself from weed protection for canopy, you know? And, you know, you'll still have some yield there, but helping out that aspect and that's what when we are saying that 60 70 thousand now we are confident like let it be you're going to still have really good yield potential but you have to make sure your weed uh you know your herbicide program is up to date and up to you know snuff because you're going to have a lot of opens you're going to have that area for those weeds to compete with your beans and so making sure you're clean is going to protect you take that money that you're spending on diesel fuel and turn back around and put it into a, a residual style product sir so when you're talking about populations avery we're we're getting real close to rolling into that kind of that time frame and we'll probably hit on this again down the road but where are you at planting population right now yeah two weeks ago i was easily just another 60 80 maybe 100 but right now last week with how dry we are and just the environment we are in i'm more aggressive in the terms of let's we, just knowing where we were in the 10-day forecast i was telling guys let's put a little extra beans out there let's protect ourselves because we're going to have what we talked about earlier we're going to have some germination but die off because of the dry soil i mean i was protecting them saying maybe do 120 and now i mean where we are right today um, we talked about that one grower is we're 140 160 thousand i mean and then we're going into double crop here and so pots per square foot, everything like that. Later we are, you know, we're increasing that quite a bit. So I'm saying right now we're anywhere, but I mean, I might be a little heavy because, and I just want to be more productive. Um, so I'm at anywhere between 140 to 160,000 as of today. But like I said, we don't have any moisture in the ground, so don't do. Right, and I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm beginning of June, my clock rolls from 140 to 160. Yeah. Um, once we get a little bit further in the season, I'm, I'm going from 160 to 180. So you know, we're, we're not there yet. Sorry to interrupt, but I had a question. So, you know, our 10 day pass, our history, you know, we've been dry for a long time. If we had moisture, do you, I mean, you had, you said June was your clock. Do you, do you stick with that all the time? But if we were cooler and wetter and we had adequate, adequate moisture, would you lower that at all? Or just, is it the date that you, switch to 140, 160,000. It's the date. It's the date. It, it's, it's based off of the amount of time we have to, to hit flowering the because day. the what Lynn's talking about, if he has flowers on Wednesday of this week, uh, Wednesday would have been what, June 7th? 7th. 7th. So from 7th to the 21st, you're two weeks ahead of when that plant should even be thinking about starting to set flowers. So. Um, Right there, if you just use the, the rough rule of thumb, one node per week, and when it's warm, we, we actually get a little bit faster than that. I mean, yeah. you're already setting an additional mm. two nodes, and that additional two nodes can set three to four pods per cluster, and you're looking at, right there, it's, it's by math, it's pretty easy, 10 bushel, mm. five bushel per node. So um, that's where all that yield comes from. You don't have that the later you get, so you have to have the increased plants because you're losing the the opportunity i guess that's what i'm getting at and that's so. kind of the thing is you know 
beans per pod, pods per node, nodes per plant, you know, is there anything we can be doing as farmers where we're sitting so, you know, the early planted stuff looking really good, how do we protect those and how do we maybe, is there anything that we can do to promote that, you know, I don't promote, save, insurance kind of do um, aspect on, you know, pod abortion, all that is a big thing too. I don't know if, is there any research out there? Is there any products out there that we can uh, protect our pod abortion or increase, you know, pods per plant out there? You're trying some. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of stuff out there that uh, pro proclaim to be, um, you know, in that realm of, of trying to, uh, you know, save the plant stress. You know, there's talks of using uh, um, strobulurins from an ethylene standpoint to try to lower the ethylene um, levels in the plant to try to keep the plant alive and thinking that it's it's still um, functioning as a living plant. Because when we get too high levels of ethylene, it signals to the plant that, hey, like I need to start to go into the senescence pro process. So um, part of that, the what, what I think from my mind from an agronomy standpoint is that makes sense, but there is certain aspects of mother nature that we just can't, like the bean or corn plant will go into survival. I think the bean thing, the biggest thing that we can do, um, we talked about is getting it sprayed as we're getting before the, the flowers are coming in. So that way we don't um, knock, knock blooms off or, or cause a stress within the plant to, uh, to, to cause an abortion of, of the nodes. Cause that's, I would say the last two years, that's been our biggest hold back of, of our bean yields. We've had really good yields, but we start looking at the plants. We've aborted, what, four or five nodes up from the bottom of the plant, all, all kind of related to, to the weather stress. So as we go through that, yeah, I mean, there's definitely um, products out there that, that are supposed to promote the, the lowering the stress levels in the plant. I would say uh, we're, we're pretty brand agnostic on this. You just have to go and try it on your own farm. Uh, visit with your uh, with your supplier or a rep for those companies. Try a little bit. Um, I'm I'm in my second year of trying a few different products on that to see what works for uh, for our acres. And our acres isn't the same as you know what uh, Ben and those guys have down in the bay or what you guys have up at your folks' house. So um, you know the, the, there's a lot of good resources out there. Uh, one I heard the other day, you know, as we look into protection and plant growth regulation, is the timing of um, when we do we switch from more of like a cytokinin to uh, gibberellic acid. Um, there's certain mechanism in soybeans plants that we're timing that we need to switch from one to the other because we don't want to promote yeah. vegetative, we want to produce fruiting basically. So um, there's a lot of great resources out there. Um, I would say academia probably hasn't got on that. This is where uh, a realm where maybe the commercial side of stuff has, has pushed ahead a little bit. So. Um, just visit with, with people in your, your circle that you know that have tried stuff like that, or if you have a trusted uh, advisor that has uh, um, those products, get with them and get the information. But uh, yeah, I mean, anecdotally, I saw some success with using those style of products. Um, it's nothing that I would put put out there to, to claim the gospel, but uh, there is definitely more research more uh, commercial development into these style of biological plant growth regulators to help us preserve protect and, and even enhance um, um yield so from that standpoint the answer is yes there's something out there um the 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 correct answer is it depends yep it might work for you it might not work for you um you just have to try it and, and, and run it across your, your acres and see if it works. And timing is everything. Exactly, yep. exactly. Good discussion so far. Uh, one more thing that we wanted to talk about because it's extremely timely is what are you thinking about um, when you are trying to control volunteer corn right now? Right now is max label rate on, uh, on you know, your intensity or, or clethodum corn killer products because um, what we know from talking with Scott Youngman at, at Corteva is that there is um, some antagonism maybe with these, with these type of products. So we want to use the full rate so that way we're making sure that we uh, take care of those, pro the, those issues with our volunteer corn. And I would say it goes even further than that from a use rate. A volunteer corn plant is the biggest yield robber of soybean yields. I mean, we could talk about having water hemp problems and whatnot, but one corn plant will take more than what a water hemp will. So we want to make sure that we hit this in the head as early as we can, mm -hmm. because once we get further into the into the development, as that volunteer corn gets taller and taller, it's really hard to uh, to get the coverage on that and get the get that down in the world and get it killed. So, what you were talking about from Scott is dicamba and 2,4-D. 
the, the growth regulator herbicides are antagonistic mm -hmm. with the corn killers, whether it be a Sure Fusilade or Clethodim or any one of those generic versions yep. of that. So you're using higher labeled rates than the, the medium to low labeled rates. Um, and also, you know, those products, when you mix them with 240, you have the ability to do sequential application. Do sequential application, you don't have to use that high of rate. Yep. Um, if you wanted to go out there with two passes, if you had your own sprayer and that made sense. Um, but also, those are really, really slow killers, almost like Roundup in, Correct. in, in April. So if uh, you wanted to heat that mix up, crop oil concentrate is definitely something you want to have in the tank. Those are the two things that I'm working on too so yeah and i would say the biggest thing that i've seen the last couple of years and hearing some other uh industry professionals talk about it we let this get too far and it is a two application process to kill that volunteer corn correct and especially for our, our viewers that may be in our, our seed production side of stuff um really probably the first time that you saw that that volunteer corn leaf pop up was the time to hit it and then probably plan on hitting it again either in your post application or in, in your fungicide application because they're just so tough to, to get knocked out. Correct. And I think that's because we're using so much 240 and uh, dicamba in our posts. So definitely a change for sure. So we have a nice surprise for this week. I didn't have to come up with a corny joke. You didn't have to come up with a corny well, joke. Well, I lost that privilege. So <laughs> They were that bad, huh? Mm -hmm. We have Avery ringing us in to uh, to get us out of here, Avery. So uh, let's hear the corny jokes this week. Yeah, so this is my version of a rain dance, all right? So hopefully it brings something in for the weekend. Uh, why shouldn't you fight with a rain cloud? No idea. It'll storm on you. So my best one I like to hear the most is, why didn't the light rain hit its target? No idea. It's just a mist. <laughs> That's what we've been Got getting here lately. One. Yep, so we're going to have to have you back on Cup of Joe if you can make it rain from making fun of the rain. You so. will be a permanent uh, fixture. There we go. Well, thank you, Avery, for joining us this week, and thank everybody for watching this week. Uh, hope everybody stays safe and is getting the rain that they need, and uh, we'll see you next week.